um, Paul Richards, uh, born in England, uh, worked in the United States since 1965 uh, and, uh, at Columbia University as a professor since 1971. I'm a seismologist. Uh, when I was a graduate student, uh, that was the era in which nuclear weapon test explosions were taking place on the order of once a week. So there was a lot to look at. Um, uh, I was in California at the time, not all that far away from the Nevada test site, and those were really interesting signals. Now, we don't see those signals now very often. Haven't seen one since May of 2009 from uh, North Korea. And let us hope that uh, there will be very few in the future. But the work of uh, identifying them, detecting them, if they happen, is, I think, an important one. And I'm, uh, I've worked at that, uh, I suppose, for the last 30 years on and off. What we have here is an intersection of interests. Uh, you know, it's not the responsibility of most of the visitors uh, from outside the CTBDO to do any work of monitoring explosions, uh, but they have an interest in the data that CTBDO has acquired. Um, I would also make the point that from the quality of the CTBDO technical operations, it's really important to have users, you know, to have um, um, professors, graduate students, consultants, just pouring over the data that you have. I know it's very hard. You can't currently, under the current rules, work in quite that mode, but I think it's terrific that a large amount of data has been released to the research community. But those people will look at it and they'll say, well, is that instrument calibrated right? Um, what's happening here? This is a rather peculiar feature. And there will be a feedback that in the end elevates the quality of the technical operations of all of these networks. So that's a, that's a, that's a big one. Uh, a good data center needs users. I would have to say that the, the difficulty with giving a simple answer is this word comprehensive. So I think it is conceptually possible to design uh, an activity that would represent in a formal sense a treaty violation that might not be caught. That's to say some type of nuclear firecracker really down low. But in the much more important sense of banning nuclear test explosions that would have military relevance, in that sense I believe that the quality of monitoring is now so high that nothing of military significance would go undetected. So in that sense, I would say it's effectively verifiable. The big thing that we have learned in the last 10 years is that a new type of data is available through CTBTO, that was not available in those early decades when nuclear explosions were happening once a week, when the political situation was so different and we did not have in-country methods to monitor what the nuclear weapons countries were doing. Um, so we had to monitor, the technically the word is teleseismically. We had to do the work of monitoring at great distance. Now that we have stations all over the world, even on the territory of the nuclear weapon states, the work of monitoring is far, far better than it ever was in the past. And learning how to do that in the almost uh, complete absence, not quite complete absence of nuclear test explosions has taken quite a while. But I think we've learned how to do it. And not only do we do it well now, but it's going to continue to get better and better and better. So it's not a static situation. It's changed. Uh, it's very good in my opinion now. It's going to get even better. Well, there's lots of little ways you can tweak the current system. I mean, like hundreds of little things that can be improved slightly. Uh, they're details. They're important to do, and that will happen. There are one or two big things that can change, and it might take five or ten years to accomplish them. And the one that's of most importance is to try and achieve a radical improvement in the quality 
of estimating the location of on the order of one or two hundred seismic events that happen every day. At the moment, on the order of a hundred events a day are being detected and reports are made. Um, uh, they are perhaps in error in their location estimate at the level of even 10, 20 kilometers. Now, in areas where special efforts have been made around the world, I'm thinking of California and Japan, where there is intense seismic activity studied with very sophisticated methods, it has been possible to reduce the errors in location estimate by factors of 10, even factors of 100. So that events are located at the level of 100 meters or so. To do that on a global scale is very well worthwhile, not only for treaty monitoring purposes, but to achieve a much better understanding of the earthquake process, to work towards even predicting earthquakes in decades in our future. So that's the big one. Instead of locating earthquakes one at a time by current methods, to work from the archive of all the signals that have been achieved in the past. And that's, that's a change in paradigm for how to do the most basic work of locating earthquakes. And that will take some time. It will happen, and that will be terrific when that comes through. Today, we can work with truly gigantic archives and search them so quickly, as everybody knows who's ever made a Google search. Uh, now, um, in the future, we will have a seismic event that occurs in a particular place, and we will want to search archives that go back for the last 20, 30, 50 years to say, was there ever a signal like the one we see today that was recorded earlier? So that in the future, in addition to the resources of the instruments that will be operating in the future, the major resource will be the decades of archives of all the signals in the past. And that's where it's so important that the digital technology and abilities to search will allow radical improvements to locate future events relative to nearby events that have to be searched for and found and compared to what's happening today. That's the change in paradigm which will reduce location errors by factors of 10 or 100. You couldn't do that without digital technology. That's the big one. It's not going to happen quickly, but there will be steady progress. We've seen it work in areas of all the size of California, uh, in, in much smaller regions. It's almost a cottage industry now for people studying seismic activity in small regions to use the archive for that small region to do the work of monitoring today. But to do that on, on a global scale, including the oceans, very few institutions can do that. And when it is done eventually by CTBDO, not only will it improve your technical work tremendously, it will be an incredible achievement in understanding planet Earth for the much broader community of people who aren't interested in treaty monitoring, but truly want to know directly where those earthquakes are. The word decoupling is applied to um, a potential evasion scenario in which a very substantial cavity is excavated at depth in the earth, and we're talking about depths on the order of hundreds of meters, even at the level of a kilometer or so. Uh, and uh, that particular scenario, uh, we have clear evidence in the debate in the United States Senate in October 1999, several senators specifically said that the decoupling scenario creates the possibility that a 70 kiloton nuclear explosion could be decoupled and therefore its signals reduced to make it look like a one 
kiloton nuclear explosion, which would not be detected. Now, that, that's, I think, a pretty fair paraphrase of a statement made on the floor of what is uh, regarded by its um, uh, people as one of the greatest debating forums in the world. And it is wrong at the technical level in numerous ways. So, in practice, to build the type of cavity that would fully decouple a 70 kiloton nuclear explosion requires a spherical cavity that's more than 200 meters across. It would have a surface area of several acres. I think it's about 35 acres. And through that surface, would, I mean, to build this um, without being detected, uh, ah. <laughs> uh, to build it and carry out such a large nuclear explosion would flood the atmosphere with radionuclide products. And finally to say, even at the level of reducing signals to a one kiloton nuclear explosion would easily be detected by the CTBTO. So, uh, so, so there is a scenario, the decoupling scenario, and the key technical question is down to what small size in practice could it be executed? And uh, on this subject, there are quite a number of pages in a report of the US National Academy of Sciences published in 2002 that made the point that there are many layers of difficulty in actually executing the decoupling evasion scenario. You have to find the right geology, you have to involve a large number of people with different specialized technical skills and impose secrecy upon you know, very many people. Uh, and then, uh, so I think it has relevance at the level of maybe the possibility of one or two kilotons. And then as you get into this technical subject, we look at the current description of the detection capability of CTBTO networks, and we typically represent them in terms of a 90% possibility of detection. But from a country planning to execute a clandestine test, surely if they want it to be clandestine, they would only be comfortable with a type of test that at the worst might have a 10% chance of being detected and they would really want to be down at the level of only a fraction of 1% of detection. So that means that they would be forced into even lower, lower, lower yields than the map characterizing 90% capability. So I'm adding many layers to this general subject to say, well, you can't rule out decoupling. But in my opinion, it would be forced, if it's going to be truly clandestine, down to such low yield levels that uh, it's, again, not going to be of military significance. 